Hello, Biology 380 fans. Since we talked about chemistry, we are now ready to talk about the four families of carbon-containing compounds that make up the majority of life. Carbon is probably uh, one of the most usable atoms, right? We talked about the four atoms that make up life. The four atoms are carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. And we know that carbon will make bonds with four additional atoms, or make four bonds. Hydrogen only needs to make one, oxygen needs to make two, and nitrogen will make three to complete their outer shell. And having that outer shell full is very fulfilling. And then these atoms are going to get made into the four families of carbon-containing compounds. Sugars, fatty acids, amino acids, and nucleotides. Here I'm going to talk to you about sugars, fatty acids, and nucleotides, and I will save amino acids for an additional lecture another time. Let's start with sugars. Who doesn't like sugar? Sugars are pretty easy to find and recognize based on their structures. The sugars that we're most interested in in biology are sugars that are either five or six carbon sugars. Here what we're looking at are six carbon sugars that are shown either in this chair structure. Right? If you're fancy and you, you know chemistry and you understand the chair structure, the structure uh, shown on the left is more commonly used in biology because that's what we understand. So how do you know when you're looking at these, these chemical structures that you're looking at a carbohydrate? Well, carbohydrates have a particular chemical formula, CH2O to the N. So in the case of glucose or, or uh, fructose, what you see is you have C6, H12, sorry, H12, O6. And you always have the oxygen here at this position. And we label the carbons as we go around the ring as carbon 1, carbon 2, carbon 3, carbon 4, carbon 5, and carbon 6. And it's important that you know how to label the structures and where the carbons are. That being said, that's about all that I care about with respect to knowing where things are in sugars, um, at least in six carbon sugars. Because what you notice is the difference between any sugars are these OH groups, OH up, OH down. I don't know which sugar is which with which OH up and which OH down. You can look that up if you need to. But you do need to know these numbers, right? If I label it over here, notice the carbons aren't shown in the chair structure because they're fancy, so it's the vertices 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Those are the six carbons. What I do care about is that you understand how we link these carbons together. Carbon, no, I'm sorry, not carbons, these sugars together. In the picture down below here, you see a glycosidic bond glycosidic bond. And in this case, the bond is between a the one carbon on the sugar to the left and the four carbon on the sugar to the left. To the right, I'm sorry. So this is a 1,4 glycosidic linkage. And it turns out that 1,4 glycosidic linkages are really important because they can either be in this position with the oxygen down or they can be in the position with the oxygen up. Alpha, one is called alpha and one is called beta. So you can have an alpha 1,4 glycosidic linkage or a beta 1,4 glycosidic linkage. So which do you think is alpha, which do you think is beta? I won't really ever ask you but it's one of those ones that 
you probably should know. It, you might like to think, ooh, this looks like an A, right? You could make that into an A. That means, of course, it's not going to be alpha. The alpha is below and the beta is above. So alpha-1,4 glycosidic linkages are important. There are other glycosidic important as well. This is once again showing you the alpha-1,4 glycosidic linkage, but you can also get linkage, right, so if we label these again, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and the 6 is up here above, you can actually get 1, 6 glycosidic linkages, so you can get this linked to the carbon up here, and that usually causes branching in complex carbohydrates. So 1,6 glycosidic linkages are also commonly found in biological molecules. Why do we care about sugars? Well, you should care about sugars because they store energy. And we know that we can neither create nor destroy energy, but we can consume energy, we can take energy into our bodies, and we have to convert it. So the energy that is stored in the bonds of sugars gets converted into a usable form of energy in your body and that usable form of energy in your body is ATP. All right. Now the bonds that contain the most energy are the carbon hydrogen bonds and the carbon hydroxyl bonds and there's a lot of these right we just showed you the structure and so the fact that sugars have a lot of these carbon hydrogen and carbon hydroxyl bonds means that sugars have a lot of energy stored in them. That's probably the number one function of sugars and carbohydrates is the storage of energy. The second most important function for sugars, right, the second most important function for sugars is in structure. And I'm showing you a picture here of something pretty ugly, right? This is a pretty ugly bug. Um, it's actually not not that much bigger than it is in real life. This is uh, something that's called a potato bug, which is a bad name. It's also called a Jerusalem cricket. Cricket. Jerusalem cricket. It is in the cricket slash locust family of bugs. That's a very technical term. And I'm showing it to you because it has this hard outer skeleton. And that outer skeleton is composed mostly of sugars. And you know that sugar to be called, most of you should out there should know, chitin. So chitin is a form of sugar. For those of you who have never seen a Jerusalem cricket. They're really quite scary. These eyeballs are look quite large and when you look at it you're kind of freaked out. Same thing in a cockroach. The reason that the sugars are used for uh, structure is because they provide mechanical support. The fact that when you step on a cockroach you hear that crunching sound, that crunching sound is the chitin breaking and it's really there to provide support. It's an exoskeleton for these kinds of um, insects. So you're going to see that the second most important function is for structure and then there are some additional functions that carbohydrates are used for. You can modify lipids with sugars, you can modify proteins with sugars. Um, glycolipids play a particular role in cell biology. Glycoproteins or proteoglycans, so that's another name, proteoglycans. Those are also proteins that have sugars. Those play additional roles. And we will talk about some of these as we go through the course, but I want you to remember that sugars play a, an important role in both mechanical support structure and in providing energy. The other sugars that we talk about in class besides chitin are cellulose, peptidoglycan. Peptidoglycan comes from bacteria. Cellulose is in plants. Those are both beta 1,4 glycosidic linkages just as chitin is a 1,4 glycosidic linkage. So all of these are 1,4 glycosidic linkages. That's important because 
humans don't process uh, beta-1,4 glycosidic linkages very well. You eat cellulose, you eat celery, because you want to lose weight. We can eat it, and it goes through our digestive system, but we don't break it down very well. We actually use energy trying to break it down. So it's a great source of water, right, and fiber, and it helps us feel full, but we don't get very many calories out of it because we can't break it down. I don't recommend eating a potato bug. I don't recommend eating cockroaches. But, right, you probably could. You probably could get some energy out of their insides at least. Probably not so much from their chitin. So that covers sugars, right? We can check off sugars. You should be able to tell me what I just told you, right? Tell me right back. What are the main functions of sugars? Where do you see sugars? What are the additional kinds of sugars that are found in cells? Etc. Okay. So that's one of the four carbon-containing compounds. The second one we're going to talk about here, fatty acids. Okay, fatty acids, right, are interesting because they have dual or amphipathic structures. Fatty acids, the fatty part of a fatty acid is this long hydrocarbon chain, right, hydrocarbon. And if you think about what hydrocarbon means, it's carbons that are hydrogenated. And if you look at this chain, this is a straight fatty acid chain because this is all, every single carbon is bound, single bonded to four molecules. So this is a saturated hydrocarbon chain. If there was a carbon double bonded to another carbon, that would be unsaturated, meaning that there, anytime you have a double bond, it means that you're not saturated. Now, that's the fatty part of this. The acid part is up on top here, and we know COO. What is COO? That's carboxylic acid. So the head of this is carboxylic acid. It is hydrophilic. Why is it hydrophilic? Well, it, it's hydrophilic because of this negative charge on an oxygen. A negatively charged oxygen is going to be highly interested in interacting with a partially positive charge on a hydrogen molecule in a water molecule. So the bottom portion is hydrophobic, all right, hydrophobic, whereas the top part is hydrophilic, giving it that dual nature, or it's amphipathic nature. Okay, the first uh, molecule shown here is showing the chemical formula, this number one. This is showing you the ball, I'm sorry, number two is the ball and stick diagram, and number three is the space filling molecule. You should be able to recognize all three of those and what each one represents. Fatty acids in cell biology are very important for the production of phospholipids. Phospholipids, remember we talked a little bit about this, are the molecules, these are the carbon-containing molecules that are going to allow us to make up membranes. And they have that dual nature, the hydrophilic and the hydrophobic portions, because they have two fatty acid tails, okay, shown down here. One, so two fatty acid tails. One is going to almost always be saturated, and one is almost always going to be unsaturated. All right, so one has a kink in it because it has a double bond, and the other is usually straight because it has no double bonds. That's important for the structure of membranes, and we'll talk more about that later. What is the purpose of fatty acids and phospholipids? Well, these have a ton of CH bonds, and what did we say earlier about CH bonds? CH bonds are important for storing energy. So fat, fatty acids great for storing of energy. We also know that these provide the building blocks for cellular membranes. And probably the most important thing 
is the ability to spontaneously form in solution. Remember I told you you can go to a catalog, you can buy some phospholipids, you can throw them into an aqueous solution, mix it up, and it will generate this structure without you having to do anything. And quite honestly, if this was not a property of these phospholipids, we may never have come about because the first living molecule that was some sort of cell that was in, that had an RNA ribozyme enclosed in it, it never would have happened if this phospholipid structure wasn't able to self-form. So that's going to be very important. All right, so fatty acid tails are trying to stay away from water, whereas this hydrophilic head group, all right, it has a phosphate group, and anytime you have a phosphate, phosphate is just like oxygen, it pulls, so phosphate can pull electrons, oxygen, so phosphate groups often have oxygens attached to them. They're going to try and grab electrons from everybody, so you have, um, a very hydrophilic group that wants to interact with the extracellular space or the cytoplasmic space on either side of a phospholipid bilayer. That was it for fatty acids. Look, we're, we're going fast, right? We have sugars and fatty acids done. I told you we would do nucleotides. All right, so here's our nucleotide part. And we might do amino acids uh, but we won't go completely through proteins because that's a longer discussion. So the nucleotides, all right, that you really do need to be able to draw some of these structures. I'll show you what I expect you to know. Nucleotides are nitrogen-containing rings, okay, with a sugar and a base. So the nitrogen ring is the base that's connected to a ribose and those two things together will come together and generate our hereditary material. When you see the structures you'll recognize, right, there's going to be a base, a sugar, and a phosphate group. It's this phosphate group that allows nucleotides to store energy. Every single molecule stores energy in its bonds, but nucleotides can store lots of energy in high-energy phosphate bonds. You know the high-energy phosphate bonds of ATP. Of course, there's also things such as GTP, CTP, TTP. All right, so A is adenosine triphosphate. Three phosphates, tri, meaning three phosphates. Well, G is guanosine, C is cytosine, T is thymine triphosphate. These all store lots and lots of energy because of the phosphate bonds. Okay. So number one function, storing energy. Number two function, okay, stores information biological hereditary information. Both RNA and DNA are nucleotides that can store information. Here is the most basic structure. This is the ribose. It is a five carbon sugar. It still has an oxygen and we number the carbons going counterclockwise. One, two, three, four, and the fifth carbon is above the ring. You do need to be able to draw this, and if you don't know how to draw it, we're going to practice drawing it. But you need to know why this is important and what portions of the molecule play a role in the biology of the cell. So for those of you out there that know what nucleotides look like. If I were to draw a nucleotide for you, the way I would start is I would start with the oxygen. And I know that it's going to make this structure. Okay? 
And I know if I label these, I go around one, two, three, four, and I know ribose is a five carbon sugar, so I put that fifth carbon up here. Okay. I probably should put right here on here. The first carbon is going to be important because that is where the base is located. And the way we draw that on this is to put a line. I don't care if you can draw the base. You draw a box up there, and let's say this is going to be, I don't know, ATP. Then you put A up here. That's going to be your A base. We'll talk about what I'd like you to know as far as the bases go, but if you get the start of this, it's all going to be much easier. On the second carbon, okay, we have uh, the addition of either hydroxyl group or, okay, not both, a hydrogen. And if you have a hydroxyl group, all right, that means you have an RNA molecule. How do I know that? Well, DNA is deoxy, so you remove the oxygen on the two position, deoxy ribonucleic acid. So the two position tells you whether it's DNA or RNA. All right, the three prime position, the carbon there is almost always an, a hydroxyl group. And that's important because hydroxyls in biology are highly reactive. Why are they reactive? Well, because of that darn oxygen. Oxygen is great. Oxygen is going to pull the electrons from the hydrogen closer to it, making the hydrogen have a partially positive charge. That allows for that oxygen to be reactive. It can interact with other molecules and generate bonds. So the three prime carbon hydroxyl group is important for adding the next nucleotide to the chain. So when I tell you later down the road that you can only add nucleotides on the three prime position of a DNA or RNA molecule, that's the three prime position we're talking about. And you're going to see that a string of nucleotides you can only add at the three prime position. You can't add on the five prime carbon. All right, so just keep that in the back of your head. All right, the four prime position, probably not that important except for the fact that it holds the five prime carbon. And the five prime carbon is where you have the addition of phosphate groups. Since this is getting highly written up, I think what I'll do is let's draw another one. Let's open a and you should be able to do this. You should be able to draw for me a nucleotide, right? I just I've just written so many of these. It's too much fun, right? I know that I'm going to have a base here, whatever base it is, doesn't matter, A, C, G, or T, A, C, G, or T, or U, if this is an RNA. Okay, on the two prime position, let's say I put H. That tells me right away, if I look at the two prime position, this is DNA, because there's no oxygen on the two prime position. Three prime position, I'm going to make a hydroxyl so that I could add nucleotides to that. On the four prime position, I have the carbon. And almost always, okay, this is going to be a CH2. And linked to the five prime carbon are phosphate groups. And the way these work is it goes O, P, O. If there's a single phosphate group, okay, that's, okay, we need to finish how many phosphate actually makes how many bonds? Does anybody know? It makes five bonds. So you, you have a double bond to an oxygen and another single bond to an oxygen. And this could be a nucleotide. It would be a, in this case, let's make this an A. This would be an AMP. Why M? Because it's a mono, meaning one phosphate group. What if it were ATP? Okay. Let's do the next page. Here's ATP. I have to draw a little smaller because now I need more space. So let's make this an A. Okay, let's make this RNA. Can we have an RNA that's ATP? Absolutely. Okay, so here's my CH2. And if I say this is ATP, but this is an RNA molecule, number one, I have to have the hydroxyl. 
And then if it's T, I'm going to have three phosphate groups. The way to do this is O, P, O, P, O, P, O. That gives me one, two, three phosphates. And I know every phosphate is going to have a double bond to an O. I'm sorry, these are not writing very well right at the moment. So a double bond to an O and an O, and each oxygen is negatively charged. Each single oxygen is negatively charged because it doesn't have, right, it should have two um, bonds to it, and instead these guys all have one bond. This makes ATP a highly negatively charged molecule. It also makes it incredibly high in energy. You should be able to draw this. Here's prettier pictures than I could possibly ever provide you or draw for you. I am providing pretty pictures for you. Notice they're, they're actually drawing the aden adenine. All right. I'm going to explain to you how you know whether adenines are two, two rings, nitrogenous rings, or one in one second. But if you look at this, right, and you look at the two prime position, there's no oxygen, which means it's deoxyribose. And it's got three phosphates, and it's got an A, so this is ATP, deoxy. Sometimes people just do DATP. That means the same thing, okay? When you write ATP, it's a little confusing because is it DATP or is it just ATP? ATP means that it, it's got an OH, DATP means it's deoxy. Here's another image showing you different ways that you might see nucleotides. This shows right, a ball and stick, I'm sorry, not a ball and stick, a space filling versus the chemical formula. Once again, we have two rings, all right, over here. It's an adenine. Here's the ribose with its five carbons and three phosphate groups coming off. O, P, O, P, O, P, O. It's the easiest way to remember that, O, P, O, P, O, P, O. Okay, if you only have one, it's O, P, O. If you have two, it's O, P, O, P, O. I think I got that right. Okay, so this is ATP. The functions of nucleotides, all right, store energy, and what else? Store information. The bases are probably the hardest thing for students to remember. I won't make you ever draw the bases, but I would like you to know which ones are the single nitrogenous ring versus the, the double. All right? So G and C, where are they? They are shown here is cytosine. Hold on. So cytosine, uracil, and thymine. And I like to remember this as C-U-T. They are pyrimidines. And how do you possibly remember that? Well, it's because you would like a really big cut of pie, but unfortunately you never get what you want. So the smaller of the two nitrogenous rings right, is the cut of pie you get. So the smaller ones are the individual nitrogenous ring, and I'm saying nitrogenous because there's all these nitrogens in these rings. And nitrogens play an important role in biology, and you should know that the nitrogenous rings that are pyrimidines are C, U, and T. That means that, excuse me, A and T are purines. Okay, so purines are the larger of the two. I don't care if you can recognize which one is uracil, your, so which one's thymine. None of that matters to me. I just want you to know that these are nitrogenous bases. Okay. And if you want a cut of pie, that's going to be a pyrimidine. Um, and pure, pure is in purine as gold. Purines, 
gold, right? Pure as gold. A and G. C, U, and T. All right, those are pyrimidines. A and G, purines. There you go. Now, we're going to put together nucleotides, and that reaction is really important because it's what generates your uh, new DNA when you're undergoing replication. It will generate strings of uh, RNA when you're undergoing transcription. And the way we add to nucleotides is always at the three prime end. That's because we're adding to where that three prime hydroxyl is that I alluded to earlier. And the reaction is called a condensation reaction. So what happens when there's a ton of condensation around? You have a lot of water, right? It gets wet. So condensation is the fact that in this reaction, a water molecule will come out. If you look here in this image, which is way better drawn than I could draw, you have this hydroxyl here, and it is going to bond. This hydroxyl is going to bond to that oxygen. And what happens is you lose, right, if you count how many oxygens are in the product over here, you only have one oxygen that's gone, okay? And what happens to that oxygen, right, the hydrogen that's with it also goes, and another hydrogen is picked up from the surrounding media. Remember, all of these reactions are occurring in water, and water is out here, right? So you have tons of water out here. But water is in equilibrium. Water is always in equilibrium. I don't know if you guys remember this, but it's in equilibrium with OH- minus and H+. Plus. So you have tons of OH- minus and H+, plus, OH-, minus, H+. Plus. These are always around when these reactions are occurring. So the loss of this hydroxyl group along with another hydrogen results in the formation of water, and that is why this is called a condensation reaction. What you're left with is this bond, and this bond is so important I can't, I, I can't say it enough. It is called a phosphodiester bond. An ester bond is usually uh, between two oxygens, and this is a phosphodiester bond. The phosphate is between two oxygens, phosphodiester bond. So this is the linkage that links one nucleotide from the three prime position to the five prime position of the new nucleotide. You need to be able to understand this, you need to be able to draw this, you need to be able to recognize it, and you need to be able to tell me, if you look at a, a picture, is it right, is it wrong, what's the problem? Okay. And that's it for those three carbon-containing compounds. So you should know carbohydrates, you should know carbs, you should know nucleic acids, and, or nucleotides, and you should know lipids, and the beginning of phospholipids. The last of the four, right, the last of the four carbon-containing compounds are amino acids they get put into protein structures. Okay, so we had sugars that get put together to make carbohydrates, which are strings of sugars that are put together. We had nucleotides that use phosphodiester linkages to make nucleic acids. And I probably should have lipids over here and this on this side would probably be membranes or phospholipid bilayers, something like that. The bonds here are glycosidic. The bonds here are phosphodiester. And do we say what might hold these lipids together? The bond is actually hydrophobic force. So that's what holds together our membranes, the hydrophobic force. Okay.
I think I'm going to call it quits for this flip lecture. We'll do another one on amino acids and protein structures.